Well, if you're a gardener, you know all about pruning. And the purpose of pruning is not less fruit, it's more fruit. Hey everybody, welcome to SJC's online worship experience. So excited you're with us today. If you're new, if it's your first time, we want to welcome you. You're in the right spot. And today we continue our Easter message series entitled All Things New. We're going to be looking at John 15, where Jesus declares that he is the true vine. It's going to be a powerful time today of prayer, worship, time in God's word. So let's get ready to do it, everybody. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Today, and we won't be quiet. 
But come shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We're gonna shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today We're gonna shout out your praise There is joy, there is joy Surely in this place be quiet. We shout out your praise. Yeah, yeah. There is joy. There is joy today. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in this house of the Lord today. Yeah. And we shout out your praise. A reading from John. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers, such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Word of the Lord. Well, hey everybody, if you've ever done some gardening, you know the importance of pruning or what appears to be a counterproductive process, cutting off, trimming back, is actually a catalyst that inaugurates new growth and gives more quality fruit. I always marvel at how a properly pruned crepe myrtle responds and thrives to pruning with such rapid growth and greater fruitfulness. It's amazing. Master gardeners tell us that when a tree or shrub is properly pruned, a chemical response is kicked in or triggered uh, it triggers a plant to develop new foliage and new, new branching. And what proves to be Jesus' farewell discourse in John's gospel, helping his disciples understand how it is that the vineyard of the Lord will flourish in the wake of his departure through abiding, trusting, and accepting the knife, if you will, of the master gardener. Of course, in the moment, they struggle to comprehend it all. Uh, but after the resurrection and the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they begin to grasp this mystery of what it means to abide in Christ, the true vine. The allegory of the fruitful vineyard runs deep in the life of Israel. It's a leading symbol of their redeemed identity as God's people. Like the motif of the shepherd, the vineyard imagery is everywhere in Scripture. The psalmist prays in Psalm 80, You brought out a vine of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The fruitful vineyard of God's people is the vision. When God brings a vine and plants it, His love and loyalty and commitment are relentless. He'll see it through all the way through. Human flourishing is the vision, flourishing to the glory of God. Israel was to be the archetype of this flourishing so that the whole world would follow its example. At least this was the plan, this was the call. The prophet Hosea said famously, Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. The more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. As his country improved, he improved his pillars. Wrapped in the imagery of the vineyard, Hosea echoes the call of the image bearer in Genesis 1 to be fruitful and multiply, but sadly in the next very next verse, Hosea remarks, their heart is false. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their pillars. 
the vineyard of the Lord, the vine of his people had become entangled, growing in on itself, laden with thorns and thistles and so much dead wood and branches. As we trace the history of Israel in the Old Testament, the vineyard it was called to be and designed to be never becomes quite itself. In Isaiah chapter 5, the prophet says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Now I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled, says the prophet speaking on behalf of the Lord. And in fact, by the time we get to Isaiah chapter 11, all that's left is a raised stump. The judgment of God is severe, but through that judgment, through the pruning, which appears to be absolute, but isn't, something greater is coming. And what was, or and what has become one of the seminal Advent readings each year, foreshadowing the birth of Jesus, Isaiah 11 verse one proclaims, there shall come forth uh, a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Jesus, of course, is that shoot. Jesus becomes representative Israel for that matter. All of his covenant promises to Israel from Adam to David reach their fulfillment in and through Jesus. Jesus abides in his father's love and the fruit is undeniable. Jesus' fruit goes on forever and his love is transforming the world all around, one heart at a time. Where Israel could not trust, Jesus did. Where Israel refused to obey, Jesus did. Jesus is the Israel of God. He is the luxuriant vine. Jesus is the true vine, and the Father is the gardener, uh, the gardener of the vine dresser. And Jesus says, follow me. Jesus says, abide in me. In fact, through the gospel, we're grafted into the vine. We become branches of the vine of Christ, which is spectacularly close, intimate. Jesus lives in you and me by the Holy Spirit, and I and you abide with Him, and God the Father is the vine dresser. Christianity is to be loved and welcomed right into the life of the Trinitarian Godhead through Jesus' perfect sacrifice. It has made us clean and acceptable to Him. Jesus says, already you're clean because the word that I have spoken to you abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Those words, you are clean, in the Greek, katharos, which has a meaning of being made pure and carries a pruning implication in that it means to be clean and cleared, separated from any other impeding or contaminating elements that might hinder fruitfulness. Jesus makes us clean by his word of grace. He does it and it's done and we're blown away. We're staggered by his love. Can you remember being conscious of Christ's love for you for the very first time? In spite of you, in spite of your flaws or your sins, your regrets, you encountered God's unstoppable love in the person of Jesus. Maybe that happened for you in a moment that you can distinctly remember or in a season of your life that you can look back and reflect on. Or maybe you grew up being nurtured in his love and you can't remember a specific moment for that matter, you can't remember a moment when you weren't aware of his love. What a beautiful testimony, the absolution of his grace. Whatever your story shape of knowing Jesus may be, the result is the same. The implications are the same. You're clean, you're his, he's divine. You are his very own branch. When I was in the sixth grade, making the middle school football team, was the biggest thing. It was so huge, especially for me. I loved football so much with a passion. I've been playing since I could pick up a ball when I was just teeny tiny, and I really wanted to make this team, but was super hyped and nervous about it when the tryouts came around. About halfway through the two-week tryout, though, the coaches hollered at me in the locker room and told me to see them in their office. I was sure that I was about to get cut from the team. I went in and they asked if I had any interest in playing quarterback, which of course, I mean, who wouldn't want to play quarterback? But instead of saying yes in my nervousness, all I could say was, I don't care, coach. I just want to make the team. They both smiled as if to say, you're already making the team, dummy. We want to know what position you want to try. I was oblivious. Jesus isn't inviting the disciples to try to be clean, to make the team, or to try to be a branch. 
They're united to the vine. He's saying, I am the vine and you are the branch. Abiding is, first of all, about what Jesus has done to rescue us. We're justified by his sheer grace and goodness, not by anything that we did. The late missionary bishop and theologian Leslie Newbegin describes the meaning of abiding or remaining in Christ like this. He says, quote, The loyalty demanded is not primarily a continual being for, but a being from. Not the holding of a position, but an allowing oneself to be held, close quote, which is the mystery of the Christian life and the mystery of life itself, of how the world will and can flourish and how the new creation will flourish. Remaining in Jesus is at once our active choice to obey him from the place of being held, loved, accepted by him. It's not an obedience for acceptance, but a trust and surrender from the acceptance that we have in him. To let Bishop Newbegin speak again, he says, Quote, abiding is the continually renewed decision that what has been done once for all by the action of Jesus shall be the basis, the starting point, the context of all my thinking and deciding and doing, close quote. Jesus wants the disciples to understand this profound mystery, this profound gospel gift that Jesus' own death and resurrection secures for us an absolution, a forgiveness, a salvation through which We've been engrafted into the vine of Christ. Paul speaks of this engrafting in Romans 11 as the gospel is for everyone, Jew and Gentile. The Gentiles are included by grace through faith. We're engrafted spiritually into Christ and called to abide in Him and with Him. This is how we're included in Him. What love, what a gift, which is the secret to abiding, to stay ever at the place of grace the place of first love. Jesus knows and knew that the journey ahead for his disciples, the challenges and temptations, the rugged terrain where they would have to walk by faith. And Jesus knows the journey ahead for all of us too, including you and me. And he's saying, hold fast to me. I already have a hold on you. This is how we're going to bear fruit and journey all the way home. Paul said it like this in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 3. He said, I take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Sometimes, if we're honest, our abiding is pretty one-sided. Like when I walk my dog Tank, I've got him secured on the leash. As his master, I'm abiding with him. I will not let him go. But he is learning to. He's struggling to remain or to abide, at least with any kind of consistent awareness of me. He's tugging. He's distracted. He wants to stop when we're walking. He wants to walk when we're stopping. He wants to murder the neighbor's cat. I meant he wants to make friends with the neighbor's cat. Sometimes I think this is probably a pretty accurate picture of our Christian lives. God's faithful, but we are self-determined, distracted, struggling against his guidance, spurning his wisdom, neglecting his word, trying to jump headlong into the path uh, of heartache. Sometimes it's not that we're being utterly wild, we're just being moderately obstinate. We're just pleasantly non-cooperative until we are jolted again, of course, by grace. And we remember our first love, Jesus. And we look around and we see how many ways he's been merciful in spite of us. It's difficult for us to bear fruit in our lives when we're pulling and tugging and pursuing our own thing. But when, by the grace of God, we begin to move with Jesus as the reference point, move in awareness of him his words his ways by the power of the holy spirit when we're walking closely to him in a way that there's no tug on the leash that's when stuff begins to change in us through us around us that's the power of abiding what are the hallmarks of abiding jesus says if you abide in me and my words abide in you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit so prove to be my disciples. His word begins to capture our attention. The means of grace once again arrest our hearts, pointing us to Jesus and his inexhaustible love. And our prayers begin to move in the direction of his will and are offered in and through his name. They begin to look and feel and sound like the prayer he taught his disciples along the way. Our Father, Abba, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven begins to sound and ring like that. And our motives, they begin to change their orbit. 
from the orbit of my own glory to the orbit of God's glory. What brings God's glory becomes central to our thoughts and to our words and deeds. Now, don't be deceived. It's a long journey. And today's maturity and abiding doesn't mean we'll be on top of it without fail tomorrow. We will falter from time to time. But the Master, Jesus, He will never let us go. The miracle of Easter is not only does Christ abide with us, but that we're called to abide in Him and with Him. And even more, here's the claim of the Christian life, that the glory of the Father, the glory of the Father is synonymous with my own deepest joy. So let us stop tugging the leash and draw near to Him, that fruit might abound to the glory of His name. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Thanks be to God.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Thank you so much for being a part of our online worship experience today from wherever you're connecting. Whenever you may be watching this, we're so excited that you're with us and our prayer for you is simple. The love, the deep, deep love of Christ is blessing over your life. And if this online experience has been a blessing to you, we want to encourage you, invite you, be a digital missionary with us. Share this service link with a family member, a friend, colleague, coworker, somebody you know who could use encouragement today. We really do appreciate that. And as always, if you're in the Wilmington area, we want to invite you. Join us in person for worship. We gather each and every Sunday, 8.30, 10 a.m. Kids ministry going strong all morning long. There's something for everybody here at St. John's Bagels Coffee Community happening at 9.15. And you can learn more about an in-person visit with us. Just go to our website, click Sundays plan your visit and we look forward to meeting you sometime soon and so many other ways to connect discover grow with us here at st john's we invite you just go to our event hub calendar page on our website to learn more about everything that's coming up ways that you can tap into a bible study or a small group we've got an alpha series that's running currently and you can jump into our alpha series alpha is the opportunity for anybody to explore christian faith in a welcoming relational atmosphere it's so much fun great conversations great food great content you'll be so encouraged just go to alphawilmington.com to learn more and to register we hope to see you at our next upcoming alpha gathering and then finally we want to say thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support toward the mission and vision here at St. John's. It's time, treasure, talent. It all comes together. People serving Jesus in so many creative and beautiful ways, both practical and, uh, you know, ways that make an impact uh, all across our community. So thank you so much for that. We want to ask you and invite you to prayerfully consider becoming a sustaining financial giver with us. When we give and contribute financially, good things happen. People's lives are impacted to the glory of God. So thank you for your generosity. Uh, we invite you to visit our webpage. Click the giving button to learn more about sustaining giving with us here at St. John's. And we so appreciate that. May the Lord build in each of us hearts of generosity as we respond to the deep, deep love of Christ. God bless you today in your giving. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you So to God and govern us 
by your Holy Spirit that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen I believe it was John Piper who said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I think that's a beautiful description of Jesus' call to us to abide, to abide in the vine. He is the true vine. And when we do that, of course, God is glorified and we discover our deepest joy. It's been such a joy to connect with you today for our online worship experience we want to stay connected with you moving forward you can find us anywhere and everywhere on social media at s-a-c-i-l-m hope you'll connect with us there friends remember as you go today jesus loves you he really really does and remember also that life is short we don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us so let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind go in peace to love and serve the lord thanks be to god until next time everybody